Okay, hi. Hello. I'll start by sharing my screen, just one second. Okay. So, hello. Um, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining me today to talk about accessibility. My name is Lula Diaz. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I'm a UX designer and I studied and became specialized in accessibility and usability. I became very passionate about inclusion in the digital world because I realized that my work could have an impact on the quality of life of many people. So I took it upon myself to study it, apply it to my work and share it with my colleagues and coworkers. So, Whenever the subject of accessibility arises, a lot of people are quite unsure about what it, what it is all about. Some might think that it refers only to making adjustments to your products or services for the benefit of people with permanent disabilities. And of course it is about them, but it's also about all of us. <clears throat> people without permanent disabilities can find ourselves disabled when it comes to performing a task for a brief period of time. And even if there is no disability involved, we still benefit from what was initially created for people with disabilities. Like uh, when you use voiceover or contr voice control on your phone. So the fact that a lot of us in, that are working in tech think that accessibility only caters to one specific type of user makes it really hard to adopt accessibility in the early stages of a product. It's always put off to the next iteration, like it's thought of as a feature, a nice to have feature. And that's the mindset that I'm trying to change today. Disability is part of being human. Almost everyone will temporarily or permanently experience disability at some point in their life. One billion, over 1 billion people, about 15% of the global population, live with some form of disability, and this number is increasing. Now, this is a quote that I got from the World Health Organization webpage. And, <clears throat> sorry, I wanted to share it with you to understand how many people we are leaving out of our products if we don't start making them accessible. To begin this journey of accessibility, let me walk you through a few definitions first. So let's start with the word that I'll be using the most today, accessibility. We will refer to it as the quality of a product or service that guarantees <clears throat> that people are not excluded from using something on the basis of experiencing a disability which leads us to the definition of disability, which <laughs> if this goes on, hold on just a second. Okay, so disability is the result of the interaction between a person with a disability and the barriers imposed on them by the environment, which prevents them from succeeding in completing tasks and developing as people without disabilities would. <clears throat> so we can unpack a few things here. People with disabilities include those with physical and perceptible impairments, as well as cognitive impairments. Number two, those disabilities might not be permanent. They might be temporary or situational, as you can see on the graph over there. Like for example, a person that is missing one arm can have a permanent disability. 
a person with an arm injury can have a temporary uh, disability and a person that is holding a newborn is going to have a situational dis disability. <clears throat> so, and number three, people with disabilities can and should be encouraged to develop as much independence as people without disabilities by providing them with an environment that accepts and adapts to their needs. And actually, that's a bit of our job as uh, product designers. So now the last uh, definition that I'm going to be talking about today is nice to have. I know that uh, most of us here has probably used that, this phrase before or has heard of it, but here's how I define it today. It's a myth. It's something that we believe in, but actually never see it get done. It's a place where ideas go and gather dust while we run after more important things or bugs or features. So now that we know all of this, where does accessibility fit? Do you still think that it should be thought of as a feature to be included in the next iteration of your product? I've worked, I've worked at, a at a few different tech companies, and I think that by now we can all agree that uh, what you do is you define a minimum viable product, and you want to launch as one which will allow you to, um, to have a functioning app or a website in the shortest period of time, and that lets you set up everything to keep evolving the product as needed. And most of the time, whenever someone brings up accessibility, Everybody likes how it sounds, but not many want to put in the time and the effort to add it to that MVP. So it ends up in the nice to have lot or the backlog of tasks. And there are pro two problems with this. One, it's really not that much of an effort if your team is trained on accessibility compliance, and we'll get to that in a moment. And two, if you put it off for the next iteration, it never happens. It falls into this nice to have Neverland where non-urgent tasks go to pile up and be forgotten due to new requirements. So the nice category is the thing we tell ourselves that we'll eventually do because it's actually so awesome, but in reality, we never find the time and effort to do it. So I am here to help you implement accessibility from the early stages by adding it to our work methodology we will be design thinking for accessibility. For those unfamiliar with design thinking, here's a definition. It's an ideology supported by an accompanying process. The design thinking ideology asserts that a hands-on user-centric approach to problem solving can lead to innovation. And innovation can lead to the differentiation and competitive advantage. As designers, we work with this ideology and use its framework to produce our best work. And it's an established workflow in which we can build and add accessibility as part of our job. The design thinking framework follows an overall flow of understand, explore, and materialize. And within these larger buckets, falls the six phases we are most familiar with. Empathize, divine, ideate, prototype, test, and implement. In this talk, we'll cover each of these and see how we can add accessibility to effectively create a user-centered design that includes all users and not just your ideal user personas. So let's begin. Okay, phase one is empathize. <clears throat> Here is when uh, we conduct research in order to develop knowledge about what users do, say, think, and feel. During this phase, it's important to add to those interviews and polls that you're going to do, you need to add people with di different types of disabilities, taking into account that the tools for conducting those interviews need to be accessible. So for now, we can rely on Google Meets and Zoom for this. And also, if you need to use a collaborative word, Miro recently added support for screen reader users, so you can do, you can use that. Only 
just keep in mind that it's only available for desktop use, not for mobile. However, I know that finding these people, these uh, people with disabilities to do research with can be quite a challenge. So I started trying to find how we can we can go about this challenge. And I found that companies like IBM tend to fill that gap by asking team members to investigate a different disability each and find what their difficulties and needs are. So desk research is always better than no research at all when it comes to people with disabilities. The second phase is define. And here we combine all the research done and observe where user problems exist. It's important to define the problem taking into account that people with disabilities will be using our product. This is the moment when we can actually take action and make sure that we are including a diverse group of people. Like Russell Akoff said, successful problem solving requires finding the right solution to the right problem. Phase number three is ideate. Here is where we brainstorm a range of crazy ideas. Crazy, creative ideas that address the unmet user needs identified in the define phase. So we can, we can finally put our brains to work on a solution. While we create freely and out of the box, it's important to have a moment to reflect on the ideas that we laid out on the table and think if it answers to all our users' needs or are we all just thinking about one type of user? You can avoid design bias by doing active listening to your diverse team members by thinking of the information of the information you have from the empathize phase and keep in mind that the problem that you defined already includes a wide range of users with different needs and environments. So don't lose sight of that. Now, phase number four is a prototype. Here, we build real tactile representations for a set of ideas that, come, that came up in the previous phase. And there are many things that visual designers can do in this phase, but I'm going to give you five tips that you can implement today when you go back to work. So the first one to keep in mind is color contrast. It's the difference in light between font and its background. In web accessibility, how well one color stands out from another determines whether or not people will be able to read the information. In order to be to make sure that color contrast is acceptable and it's readable, you have many plugins on Figma, on Sketch, and Google Chrome has extensions that will let you easily check for contrast before going into production. The second tip to keep in mind is typography. It's important to use a large enough size font so that people can comfortably read. You can choose a, ty a typeface that emphasizes clarity and legibility. Sometimes that might be a sans serif, as we see in most user interface products. And when it's larger text, uh, large portions of text, that will, will most of the time uh, use uh, a serif font. But if that's not set in stone, you can, as a designer, you can try out different things and see what works best. But it's important that you keep legibility in mind because users shouldn't have to make a big effort to read your platform's messages. And last, don't forget to use headings to communicate higher hierarchy. Tip number three is minimalist design. This is not about an aesthetic that you see on Pinterest. Uh, it's actually about not overcrowding your page with visual information that will distract the user from the task that they, uh, that they want to accomplish. Save your creative and beautiful visuals for specific part of, parts of your website and let the user concentrate on what they actually need to do. Tip number four is for those uh, designers that need to deal with GIFs and video. If you're designing either, you need to keep in mind that flashes 
should be three or below per second. This is to avoid ruining your user's experience uh, with a massive headache that can, that can be caused by flashes, or in the worst case scenario, uh, seizure in epileptic patients. Also, for video, it's recommended to always use, use and add uh, closed captions so that everyone can understand what's going on. And last but not least, clear call to action buttons. This is not only about the design of a clear uh, primary call to action button, but it's also about the text. You need to let the user know exactly what they are going to do or, or what they are signing up for. Use simple and understandable words. Call to action text should be clear, brief, and useful. And for phase number five, it's test. This is the moment of truth. This is when we find out if what we built is of actual use to our users. And in order to ensure that our prototype is accessible, we need to test it out with users with disabilities. It's non-negotiable in this phase. Our mantra as UX designers is always that we are not the users. So even if we want to imagine how a person with a disability might use our product, we can never know for sure. So it's important that we take some time and resources to find people to actually test our product with. And the last phase is implement. This is when we put our vision into effect. Sometimes this is the most difficult part to include accessibility in because not all developers are well-versed in, well, in web accessibility, and they tend to think that it takes a lot of time and effort. And they're not that wrong, actually. I mean, understanding how and when to use Y area and learning all the web content accessibility guidelines can be hard. But there are other things that can be done to ensure that your product is accessible while you and the team study web accessibility. So, for uh, developers, I'm going to give you also five tips to uh, include in your work today. First is uh, using an accessible component library. When you choose a, a library or UI kit that was developed with accessibility in mind, you can rest assured that most of the work has been taken into account for you. I'm going to give you an example. My boyfriend and his team developed an education platform before they began thinking about accessibility. So when they started testing it, they realized that having used Material UI made the product more accessible than they had thought. And the fixes that they had to do weren't so big as they imagined at first. So to keep in mind, there are other accessible component libraries for, for instance, we have Gromat, which is also for React, uh, or Angular Material, if you're using Angular. There are many libraries online that you can choose from, depending on the technology that you want to use on your product. But you have to make sure that they provide accessible components. Uh, so tip number two is responsive. Now, responsiveness is a must nowadays. Um, and it's important to keep in mind that this requirement is not only for developers, but also for designers. So if you are a developer and you realize that you need additional screens to make the adaptation look good, do not hesitate to request it from the designers on your team. While you're working on a responsive product, uh, please consider that people with low vision, they might use uh, the browser Zoom or the smartphone big typography settings so make sure that the design doesn't break when the user zooms on the text. Tip number three is um, use alternate text. Everything that is represented visually on your product needs to have a text that a screen reader can read for people that have visual impairments. This applies to images that accompany text and need a description. And it also applies to icons and buttons that require a specific label that will help users that need assistive technologies know what that button is for. Tip number four is um, 
keyboard navigation. Uh, this is also super important. Uh, people need to access your product by keyword. They need to jump through the elements of the page using the tab key. For people with physical disabilities, they use uh, assistive devices to access computers or phones. So being able to use them by tapping is vital, actually. So this is the part where you test and you work with your QA bodies uh, to make sure that you can navigate everything with your keyboard. And tip number five, last but not least, correct use of landmarks and headings. This tip is actually connected with the, with the previous one. When you depend on a, on a keyboard to navigate, you should be able to jump through different elements on la different landmark elements actually uh, on your page, like main, nav, uh, and aside, for example. And that makes it easier for people that use assistive technologies uh, to navigate at a faster speed. And so when you put correct landmarks and use appropriate headings, that means using headings not as a style, but as a structural heading, you help users decide what they want to skip and what they want to read or navigate further into. So as a bonus, uh, I'm going to give you another tip, which is uh, collaborate with the designers on your team. I mentioned it before, but I can't, I can't stress this enough. Uh, working together means that we can all learn together and create better products. Do not be afraid to ask us, the designers, about what we do, why we do it, what are, what's your process like? And you need to be open about your work too, because communication is a key that leads us to better results. So by now we finished reviewing the entire design thinking process. And in case you didn't notice, I never mentioned product owners or product managers and those leader and those leadership roles, right? So let's see about that too. What about product owners, product managers, architects, and team leads? Well, they also play a very important role in the making of a product because we, the designers and developers, we rely on them to make sure that the decisions early in a project support an accessible outcome. They are actually responsible for assessing the risk of having an inaccessible product, and they need to be able to reduce the cost of creating accessible content by putting that effort into the design phase and not afterwards. And you don't need to be an accessibility expert, but ensuring that you have a diverse team that has knowledge on accessibility, and if they don't, you ask them to research it and put it into the work, it will get you better results than resigning accessibility for the next iteration, sending it off to the land of the nice to have. So I wanted to leave you guys with this quote. Accessibility is not just a practice. It's a culture and a mindset. I took this quote from IBM's accessibility page and you will see in the chat a short list of interesting links that I curated for you to check out concerning digital accessibility. So I hope you take this home with you and remember that accessibility is not just for people with disabilities, it's for all of us. So thank you for staying with me so far. And I don't know if there are any questions. Hey Lula, no, we don't have any questions for now. Okay, cool. 